Welcome everyone to chapter number 16. This is section one. We're talking about vector fields. All right, so in this video, we'd like to go ahead and sketch, right, a given vector field. What do these things actually look like? It's a field of vectors. And then we're gonna recognize that actually these kind of fill in some missing gaps. So I'm gonna try to tie these vector fields to things that we've already been dealing with and kind of show you kind of how these things actually, right, they fit in the class. Okay, so let's go ahead. We got a definition here. Let D be a set in the plane, right, R2. Then we have maybe a vector field. And we're going to say on R2 is a function, and this is nice bold F right here, that assigns to each point in that plane, D, uh, right, a two-dimensional vector, which I'm going to call f of xy, because it'll depend on your x-coordinate and your y-coordinate. So you can have vector plane. <laughs> sorry, you can have vector fields in planes. You can also have vector fields in space. So if you have e, uh, some set in R3, right, that's space, then we can have a vector field. On R3 is a function, again, we'll use maybe f, and this is bold, right? It's assigning a vector to each point in x, y, z, space, right? We get a vector, and let's see, f of x, y, z. Okay, so this is a fine definition, but let's actually see what it means, right? So here's an example. We have this rule, right? So f of x, y, which says, you know, at each point x and y, we're going to go ahead and assign this vector. In this case, it's negative y, comma, x. So that's the vector that we are assigning. All right, so in order to sketch this thing, let's go ahead and we're going to choose maybe four or five, six points or so and just try to get an idea for this, right? Uh, there are infinitely many points in the plane. Uh, we're just going to choose a few of these things. So maybe let's go ahead and start off at... Uh, maybe the point zero, zero. So that's where x equals zero and y equals zero. Then we're going to have the vector. And let's see, negative y, so negative zero, comma, x, which is zero. So right, we're using these points right here. So negative zero, zero. So that means at this point zero, zero, we have the vector zero, zero. Okay, that's a pretty boring vector. How about at another point? So how about at one, zero? So at one zero, that means I'm over here. I'm gonna have the vector, and let's see, we have negative y, so that's negative zero, comma x, that's gonna be one. So we have really zero, one. So at this point, one zero, we have the vector zero, one. So it's gonna look something like this. So it goes left and right zero, it goes up one. All right, so at this point, I would suggest pausing the video Maybe do out another five or six of these on your own, and then go ahead, unpause the video, and I'll show you kind of the results that I get. All right, so this is what I have so far. So I went ahead and I continued choosing points 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, negative 1, 0, negative 2, 0, 1, sorry, 0, negative 1, 0, negative 2, and then drawing the corresponding vectors. And you see that this is kind of a spin field, right? So this actually, it's spinning around. It's sometimes called a spin field. Let me go ahead, and I'm going to choose maybe one more here. I'm going to choose this point. So at the point, so this is 1, comma 2, we get the vector. And let's go ahead, we switch these, and we do a negative y. So we have negative 2, comma 1. All right, so at this point, we would go negative 2 and up 1. So left 2, up 1. So we get this point. So right there, you can see kind of at every single point in space, you can draw a vector. I just chose some kind of nice uh, points. But again, you could choose like this one, and you'd probably get this. You could choose here, and you get this. And so you can kind of see that you have a lot of spin. All right, so this is just kind of spinning around. Okay. This actually, we can graph these in the Monroe 3D Calc Plotter, so I wanted to show you this as well really quick. So we're going to go ahead and add to our graph a vector field. Right? So here's our vector field. We have some options, so these are going to be the components, M, N, and P. Uh, we're not going to have P's right yet. That's going to be for if we're doing space. So in this case, we had negative Y, X, right? And so we're going to go ahead, hit enter here, and let's go ahead and take off this thing. So you can notice this is just in the xy plane. 
there we go, just in the XY plane. And you can see that indeed it spins around in kind of this counterclockwise direction. And you can do all sorts of things here. You can notice that actually these vectors are scaled by dividing by four. If you didn't do the scaling, they kind of all run into each other. I mean, this is kind of more like what our picture looked like. So oftentimes these things are scaled down by a factor in order to make them look a little bit nicer. And if you'd like more of these things, so why don't we go ahead and maybe have 20 of them along the x-axis and 20 of them along the y-axis, you see you get a much denser uh, vector field, right? Because there really is a vector at every single point in space. It's just how many of them do you draw, right? Okay, so that's our vector fields right here and how we can draw these things. Now, as promised, it turns out vector fields actually kind of fit into a lot of the stuff that we've been discussing already in this class. So I want to think a little bit about dimensions, right? And the claim is when you think about dimensions, they actually fit in. So for instance, if you think about a function that takes one dimensional items to one dimensional items, right? So this is something like back in the day, like y equals f of x, or something like x equals, you know, some parameter in terms of t, right? So x is a function that relies on t. An example of this, right, maybe like y equals 2x squared minus 3, or for instance, like x of t is equal to 3t minus 1, right? This takes a one-dimensional item x, and it spits out a one-dimensional item y, right? It takes in a number, and it spits out a number, right? So here's kind of the picture. Again, we kind of take a one-dimensional item, an x value, and we spit out a y value. Okay. We also had things that where we took two dimensions down to one dimension. So that's going to be something like z is equal to a function of x and y. So it takes two inputs, two dimensions, x's and y's, but the output is only a number. It's a z value. So for instance, something like z equals x squared plus y squared. So again, if you give me a specific x value and a specific y value, I'll tell you a z value, a height. But again, it's just one number that gets output. So it takes in two things and it spits out one thing. Now likewise, we can also do stuff uh, with three dimensions down to one dimension. So for instance, like temperature, maybe temperature depends on a function of x, y, and z. So something like t is equal to x, y squared plus 2z. And the way that I visualize this, right, so every single point, every x, y, and z in space, maybe you can attribute a temperature to it. So I went ahead and I put a bunch of numbers here. Right, so every point in space you get a number, right? You give me three things, the x value, the y value, the z value, I'll give you one thing, the temperature. So that's a way to transform three dimensions down to one dimension. We've also done stuff like where you take one dimension and you spit out two dimensions. So this would be something like our r of t, which depends on maybe x of t and y of t. So something like r of t is equal to this is 2t comma sine of t. Or another way we've expressed this before, right? R of t, you may use the um, x of t times i plus y of t times j, right? Where these are the kind of standard base vectors right there. Okay, so in this case, right, the input is a t value. You tell me t, and I'll tell you an x value and a y value. So you give me one thing, and I'll give you two things, an x value and a y value. And likewise, we've plotted these space curves, well, in space, right? So we've done maybe an r of t, which is relies on x, y, and z. And each one of those has a parameter t. Right, so something like maybe r of t is equal to, I don't know, two-fifths t sine of t cosine of t, something like this. So that would be this picture right over here. So again, you give me one thing, a t value, and I'll give you an x value, a y value, and a z value, right, a point in space. All right, so those are all of the things that we've done so far, right? But the claim is if you kind of make out a little graph, you can see that we've done from one dimension to one dimension. We've done that. We've done from two dimensions to one dimension. Great. We've done from three dimensions to one dimension. And we've done from one dimension to two dimensions or from one dimension to three dimensions, right? We've done all of these things, but there are some missing pieces, right? There are some things that we haven't done. We haven't done from two dimensions to two dimensions, for instance, until now. 
So the claim is vector fields fill in these last kind of four remaining holes right here. This would be filled with vector fields. And like it mentions here, right, for better or for worse, these things are going to be our friends for the rest of the semester. So for instance, two dimensions to two dimensions, right? So this is going to be an f of x, y, and this is going to rely on two things, right, x's and y's, and it's going to spit out two things. So maybe a p of x, y, and a q of x, y. So something like this. And maybe we go ahead, f of x, y, and well, the example that we had before, right, where this one was, what, negative y comma x, this would be an example of something that takes in two things, x's and y's, and spits out two things. So we kind of already have our picture that looks something like this, kind of this nice spin field, right? So I'm just going to draw, this is going to be kind of a messy picture, but... We did a more be we did a better one earlier, but okay. So here's our spin field. It takes in two values, x's and y's, and it spits out two values. We can also do three dimensions to two dimensions, right? So maybe if you have an f of x, y, z. So something that relies on these three variables, and I'm going to go ahead. I need to use another line here, but we're going to have it outputs two things. So p of x, y, z and q of x, y, z. Okay, so maybe an example of this, f of x, y, z is going to be equal to, and we can do maybe z, x squared, uh, let's do times y, oops, comma, and maybe like 2y minus x minus z, or something like this. So in this case, you notice that there is no z component. So if you wanted to graph this, right again, you're kind of inputting three dimensions. You tell me a point in space, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you a two-dimensional vector. So a two-dimensional vector, it's not going to have any z components in this case. So it's going to be shifting you know, left and right and things like this, but it's not going to have any up and down. It's kind of sometimes hard from the perspective you know, to show that there's really like this. I just wanted to point back. But it kind of looks like it's pointing up. <laughs> All right, so something like this. Likewise, we can do two dimensions to three dimensions, right? So maybe you just input two things, an f of x, y. And I will output three things. So maybe p of x, y, q of x, y, and r of x, y. So for instance, f of x, y, something like x squared y comma 2y minus x comma 3xy. So I'm again outputting three things and they depend on x's or y's. So in this case, right, you tell me a point in the plane, two dimensional thing, and I'm going to give it a three dimensional vector. So in these case, right, they can point up in interesting directions because there is a z component to my vectors. All right, so something like this. So again, you give me a point on the plane and I'll give you a three-dimensional vector that I want to attribute to that point in the plane. And then finally, three dimensions to three dimensions. So f of x, y, z is gonna be equal to, and now a vector, p of x, y, z, Q of X, Y, Z, and R of X, Y, Z. So something like this. Each component now depends on X's, Y's, and Z's. So maybe an example here. So F of X, Y, Z is equal to, and I'll do something, maybe X, Y, sorry, uh, X, Y squared, Z, comma, 2x minus z, comma, 3xy. So again, each one of these can have z's in it. Notice there's only z's in the first two. There's not z's in the second. Likewise, the second one doesn't happen to have any y's. 
Which remember, this notation means that they can have x's, y's, and z's in them. They don't all need to necessarily. So in this case, right, you give me a point, a three-dimensional thing, and I'm going to give you a vector that I want to attribute to that point, right? And so it's going to have x, y's, and z's, because this one can they point up and down in all these interesting places. So something like this. All right, and then finally, maybe the last thing we should do is show you on the Monroe 3D Calc Plotter, right, we can actually graph these more complicated ones as well. Now, in this class, right, we really don't do so much of the three dimensions to two dimensions and the two dimensions to three dimensions. So, I don't know, I don't really want to cross them out, but we really don't do these so much. The big ones that we do are really the two dimensions to two dimensions and three dimensions to three dimensions. So that's really going to be our focus. But you can see that we can fill in this entire table up here. Okay, so let's go ahead and back to the Monroe 3D Calc Plotter right here. And then we're going to go ahead and give us a, uh, a third component as well. You know, notice that they do M's, N's, and P's. That's fine. So let's go ahead and let's start sprinkling in some Z's here. So it's maybe Z minus X minus Y. And if you just do that, you can see that they kind of point up and down. So that right now this is really going from two dimensions to three dimensions. But if we'd like to, right, we only have one along this Z axis. So let's go ahead and change that and also do 20 along the Z axis. And this may take a second, right? It takes, there's a lot of computations now. So let's go ahead and hit this. Hoo -ah. <laughs> let's go ahead and scale by a bigger factor here. Let's scale by 10. Maybe the picture will be a little bit nicer. There we go. Maybe with 20, and yeah, it will not rotate at all. <laughs> there, oh, it did a little bit. So yes, yeah, so you can see there is a vector at every single point. All right, I need to stop the rotation here. You can change this. Maybe let's only do five in each direction. Just make it a little bit more manageable. And let's reduce this, so our scalings by or something. All right, so there we go. We can see that there's, in every point in space, right, you attribute a vector to this. It has x's, y's, and z's in the components, so it can point up and down, left and right, really wherever you want, sort of deal. And this is how we can graph a vector field in three dimensions to three dimensions. All right, I think this has been a nice intro. We're going to do some more stuff with these in class. I'll see you then.